Good evening. One of the best parts of my job is to say this. This is the coolest place on the planet right now. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Eric Beery. I'm a professor in the Department of Neurosciences here at UC San Diego, and I have the special privilege of being the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Clarke was an icon of the 20th century, a uh, renowned technologist. He invented gravity technologies. He was a physicist, a, a writer, and most notably was the, uh, the, writer, the screenplay writer of the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. And there's a little cautionary tale about AIs in that movie if we remember. However, your homework, your homework is to watch the movie 2010 because you get the story behind the AI. And I won't give you the spoiler because you gotta go watch it, so. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's, uh, it's great to be back here in Great Hall. We had uh, fabulous events um, in the before times, and it's just lovely to be back here, such a fantastic venue at our university. Um, and I, again, I just, I'm kind of soaking it in here, the beautiful windows as the sun sets uh, here in San Diego. And it's such a special place here um, where we have so many amazing things at our university. As the director of the Clark Center, we, do, we are the Center for Human Imagination. And so we cover all kinds of things around the phenomenon of human imagination. And in fact, today, uh, uh, the reason we're holding this event is that we've been having a special uh, uh, ideation workshop, an imagination workshop, um, around the phenomenon of an imagination, what we're gonna be doing in our center. So we have uh, luminaries from philosophy and science and literature um, with us today, uh, working on, our on imagination. We've had super fun ideas around philosophy of imagination around brownies today. Our team members know that, yes. Hence the brownies on the, uh, we knew it was coming, so the brownies are on the, on the buffet there. We've even had the suggestion that the imagination could be the apotheosis of the universe itself. It could be the ultimate reason for the universe, um, the instantiation of imagination. We're working on that, and we're, we'll see, and we're working on uh, some donors on that idea. So if you, if you want to follow up on that, uh, see my colleague Steve, and he'll, he'll help you out there. Um, but this evening, uh, what I want to do is uh, take advantage of the, the amazing people we have here um, on a theme around evolution and imagination. And so this evening we have uh, Dr. Stephen Asma, who's written the book, The Evolution of Imagination. Just happen to have my copy here, which I will be getting signed shortly. You'll be able to take a look at. Um, and Stephen has been talking to us today about his ideas. And our own UCSD, uh, Dr. Craig Venter, uh, who was, led the team to first decode the human genome. So it's a fabulous privilege. Thank you so much for being here with us, Craig. Craig also has a book out, a new book in, in his series of books um, about his uh, voyage around the world, and we'll get him to, to talk about that uh, in just a moment. So this evening, we're going to have a fun conversation um, uh, around this phenomenon of imagination, evolution. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about genomes and DNA um, and all kinds of fun other things. But what I'd like to do is also uh, introduce my co-host, the research director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, Dr. Cassandra Beaton. Cassie. Thank you so much. And again, thanks to all, all, all of our workshop participants and my fabulous Clarke Center team members. It was a privilege to see you today at the table with us in our discussion. So we, we, uh, we love you and appreciate all the work that you do. 
So uh, let's, let's get started. So Dr. Venter, uh, you've, you're on the book tour right now and you've been talking about your voyage around the world. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what provoked you to do that and some of the things that you've been finding on your trip around the world. Well, it's a long story that starts back uh, in 1995 when my team sequenced the first genome in history, that of a bacteria. And we sequenced it using a new method uh, called uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing based on developing new algorithms that could assemble complex mixtures. So it's, uh, uh, you know, if you can imagine tearing apart the Sunday New York Times, you know, in a shredder, um, like maybe 100 copies of that all mixed together, and then you have to realign all the pieces. So that's what our algorithm does. We break the genetic code down into, um, for the first genome, it was 25,000 pieces that we had to sequence 500 letters of. And then the computer reassembled the 500 letter length pieces in back into the entire chromosome. So the real breakthrough was in the mathematical alignment and just having the idea to do that. Um, we started getting request to sequence genomes from all around the world, and we were sort of given unlimited money, even though the government wouldn't fund the first experiment. Of course, lucky you. Yeah. And uh, we were sent a clinical sample from Norway uh, that, from a patient that was uh, not responding well to therapy, and it was supposedly a single species, but on uh, sequencing the genome, the computer algorithm assembled two separate but closely related genomes. And that was the first hint that I had that how powerful of a tool we had. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, I set out on the fool's errand to sequence the human genome, which instead of 25,000 pieces, we had to sequence 25 million pieces. And so you can imagine the computer algorithm and the computers got much more complicated. Uh, I had to build the third largest computer in the world just to do that. Um, but it was clear after doing that that uh, every species and every human has a unique mathematical solution for their genome. And so I was certain that we could do very complex mixtures you know, for example, grinding up all the people in this room and then sequencing the DNA, and then we could resort it back into your genomes. If only we did it in the my, microbial world instead. Um, uh, after sequencing the human genome, I took uh, six months to sort of recoup my brain, and I sailed down to Tortola and lived on my boat, and. Uh, uh, and enjoyed life for a brief period of time. But uh, I've always been associated with the ocean, swimming, sailing, surfing. Um, and I was reading reports about the lack of diversity of life in the oceans. And this didn't make any sense to me. Um, before DNA sequencing, the field of microbiology was based on what you could grow in culture in a lab or what you could see under a microscope. So in the Sargasso Sea, which is the sea surrounding Bermuda, uh, they numbered the organisms one at a time as they discovered them. They were up to SAR-11, so Sargasso Sea 11. And this just seemed totally absurd to me, but apparently I was the only one. And so I proposed doing a shotgun sequencing uh, from microbes filtered from uh, a barrel of seawater. Uh, there was one other person who believed in my idea. Fortunately, it was the head of biology at DOE. Uh, even though all the reviewers turned down my grant with extreme prejudice, uh, he overrode them and funded the experiment because uh, he believed in big computing and biology. And, the first results just from a barrel of seawater, uh, we discovered 2,000 new species and stopped sequencing after one and a half million new genes were discovered. And so that, that was the initial paper and the initial study. 
the, the book is about, uh, you know, what, what came next. Um, the questions were, was the ocean a giant homogeneous soup? Or was there going to be a lot of different environments? So we followed the expedition of the Challenger expedition from the 1870s, which was the first true scientific expedition. And they stopped every 200 miles and sent a dredge down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the theory uh, from the brilliant scientists at the time is there could be no life below 1,800 feet. Uh, every place uh, they sent a dredge down, they discovered new life. So we followed their route, starting in Halifax, and took samples every 200 miles and sequenced them instead of looking at them. And we found 80% of the sequences were unique every 200 miles. So in a, in a short while, uh, we discovered uh, more new species uh, than there are stars and galaxies in the universe, which helped us recruit physicists and mathematicians because they realized biology was far more interesting. Uh, so uh, the book's about the, the science of what all this diversity does, like provide 50% of the oxygen we breathe and also how we're in danger of changing it. But also it's a sailing adventure story and uh, uh, talking about how I got arrested twice and uh, um, almost arrested m multiple other times um, because of concerns over who owned the genetic resources in the oceans. But uh, I did an interview with a reporter recently from Nature magazine and uh, uh, she said, uh, I can't believe the number of near-death experiences you had on this journey. And my comment was, they didn't set out to be that. So <laughs> anyway, uh, you can order the book from Amazon or from Harvard Press, who's publishing it. So, One anecdote you shared before was uh, some of the more disturbing findings you found in the oceans in your, uh, in your travels about the various zones of the, the ocean that had uh, worrisome uh, situations? So, well, there's several types. I mean, there's multiple mile wide plastic islands from all the trash that's accumulating. Uh, but oceanographers have been characterizing these anoxic zones. Uh, there's been a huge one that's growing off of the coast of Oregon. Uh, these are totally dead zones with no oxygen, fish can't live, uh, uh, marine mammals can't live there. The largest one's now the size of Africa. And these are growing. If that keeps happening, uh, we're gonna suffocate because that's where our source of oxygen and the basic uh, food source for every uh, uh, plant and animal uh, that we're aware of. Wow, so perhaps one of the most important messages from your, boy, from your travels. Cassie, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, yeah. So, Stephen, I'm gonna turn my attention toward you to begin with, and at the Arthur C. Clarke Center, sometimes we run into the idea that imagination studies are kind of um, a luxury, right? They're just, you know, effervescing to the very top of this kind of very light idea of why would somebody study imagination? How could that be anywhere near the most important thing to spend money on? And we actually tend to think that it is potentially one of the most crucial elements of being human that we could possibly want to cultivate, learn how to understand, and learn how to advance. Why is this? Because almost every single human invention, every advancement that has helped society, every discovery, um, every social movement, started with someone asking the question, what if? What if this could be better? What if this could be different? What if this connects to this? What if that connects to that? And, you know, similarly with evolution of imagination, we talked about today how you know, we've built all, all of our brain for safety and security, and then we affection, and then fear, and then reward systems, and then at the very tippy, tippy, tippy top is imagination. But is that really true? Like, 
what is the evolution of imagination? Um, thank you. That's a very difficult question. Uh, first, I have to say that your uh, findings, my imagination is very peaked because I have a phobia about deep water and colossal squid and so forth. So anyway, you just <laughs> ruined my night. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but I do think um, that, yeah, the imagination gets short shrift because it gets turned into, oh, you're talking about entertainment and fantasy. And the Greek word fantasia is how we, you know, think about, oh, you're talking about Walt Disney or Hayao Miyazaki or something. But really, the imagination is, I think, the, the foundation of, of the mind itself. Because what human beings do is they um, organize their world according to the stories they know, according to the images that they make. And in a way, we can't think without imagination. Um, I just, this is a very interesting week for me because here we are on stage with an amazing scientist. And a few days ago, I was on stage in Brooklyn with uh, two great actors, Paul Giamatti and Paul Rudd. And I do a sort of a podcast with Paul Giamatti. Some of you know who Paul Giamatti is, I think, maybe. Paul Rudd, sexiest man alive, apparently. <laughs> but those people, um, I mean, Paul Giamatti played uh, John Adams in the HBO thing, Sideways, Billions. They're great actors. And what I find is that, in a way, what they're doing is not that different, I think, from what Craig does. This is just my take, is because I think science is loaded with imagination. And it's not quite as playful, maybe, as what these actors are doing. But I think play is, first of all, everybody does it. All mammals do it, even. Rough and tumble play is very common for mammals. If you look at affective neuroscientists, Jak Pangsep did experiments with rats and found that they laugh and play. All, all mammals seem to play. And what I think uh, these great artists, actors are doing, and I think what scientists are doing is play is a kind of investigation. And so you might be playing in the realm of character, like how can I play this character better? How can I do this painting? Or you might be playing in the area of theory construction. What can I, can I look at these data points and make an induction about a, a sort of a, a theory that then we can draw deductions on? That is also part of the imaginary process. You're, you're taking individual observations and you're trying to make some kind of universal claim and then test that claim against possible contenders. And I think, um, I see now that I'm doing this podcast and spending a lot of time with these celebrities, I'm seeing that they're also, like Paul Giamatti, for example, is walking around his kitchen, like sort of just babbling uh, improvised dialogue that he thinks his character might say. And he's sort of investigating where would the character go under these conditions. And I was asking him, how do you play um, you know, somebody like John Adams? And he said, well, you can read all the, you know, the biographies and and all of the sort of descriptions of Adams, but for him, what opened it up was he, he read, the, somebody had compiled all the sort of medical complaints that John Adam had, had listed in his diary. And so it was just, you know, my teeth are bad, I have, you know, constant abdominal pain, you know, typical sort of 18th century stuff. But he got the sense that the guy was a hypochondriac, and then that helped him, in a way, find the character. So I think that, um, in terms of the evolution of, of imagination, my own view is that um, people f realize that human beings get very interesting around 30 to 40,000 years ago. I mean, you have anatomical uh, modern humans at like 150, 200,000 years ago, but you have art, cave art, you know, Lascaux, Chauvet, around 30 to 40,000 years ago. And a lot of people think, well, human beings get really interesting once language comes on board. And it's true, they do, because they can tell stories and they can unite and eventually develop things like science much later. But I think the imagination is even before that, even before sort of descriptive language, people are using dance and image making in order to sort of communicate with each other in order to bond as a social group. So one of the things I'm interested in in my work is trying to understand, just like somebody like Chomsky would look at language and try and figure out what's the deep grammar of language, my interest is, what's the deep grammar of, of imagination? And I think the imagination is basically like having a second universe in your head. So it has its own laws of physics. What might those be? And that's really what I'm trying to do in my book, is trying to figure out what are those. I mean, here, one simple example, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop. But 
Um, one of the things you find in really early culture, uh, whether it's like the Epic of Gilgamesh or it's Egyptian sculptures or the Greek mythology or religion, you find a kind of hybrid mashups where you take like a zoological category like a quadruped and then you mix it with a human being. And you find that in all human culture, some of the earliest imagery you find are these hybrid creatures, these chimeras. And um, so one of the things I think might be happening is that there's a kind of grammar to the imagination. And so that's one of the things I'm exploring, so. Thanks very much. So Dr. Venter, you, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, well like, you guys are gonna start talking together in a minute. <laughs> Uh, what provoked this whole uh, uh, invitation and, and event was uh, a speech that you gave a few years ago that my wife and my eldest went to, where you publicly shared about your own form of imagination. And um, so I'll let you describe that and how that affected your education and your view of the world and how you work with people. Because the variations of imagination in its, in its evolution, I think, are super exciting and interesting. If you might please tell us about your imagination. Well, it's hard to know uh, where to start. Um, I'll have to imagine a few things first. Uh, but uh, I can't even imagine there's a school for imagination. I mean, I was not aware of that. But, uh, so, um, but uh, I actually discovered it uh, when I was a student here in the early 70s, uh, undergraduate. Um, I was the first graduating class from Muir College and was going through school with my first ex-wife. Um, and um, it turns out she had a perfect photographic memory. Uh, during a test, she could actually pull a book off the shelf, sort of look up the, read down and look up the answer and then write it down. That's not fair. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm so lazy if the book was in front of me, I probably wouldn't have done that. But uh, uh, that's where I sort of first learned by comparison uh, that in fact, I couldn't see any pictures. If I close my eyes, it's just black. Um, uh, unless I've had a lot to drink, then there's flashing lights and things. But, uh, um, and uh, it, it was only more recently that I discovered there was a term for this, uh, the Fantasia, which actually was discovered in the late 1800s. Uh, and the physician who described it uh, said it's a trait primarily found in scientists. Um, we didn't know how broadly he searched at, at the time. Uh, so I think in concepts, not in pictures. And our education system is totally selected for rote memorization. Uh, and so people that have photographic memories or are good at rote memorization have a pretty easy ride through the education system, um, and they only run into problems once they leave the education system. Um, so, but uh, with having to think in concepts, um, I also have some other traits. I'm on the far extreme of intuitive thinking. Uh, how much that's related to aphantasia, I have no idea. Uh, but the combination is extremely useful. Once you're out of the education system in a system where all of a sudden all these skill sets come into play. Uh, so, you know, I struggled. Uh, um, I, I barely graduated from high school. Um, you know, I got a D minus instead of an F in a government class. Uh, by writing a paper on why Barry Goldwater should be president, uh, which was the prejudice of my government teacher. So otherwise, I would have flunked out of high school. So, um, and uh, got, moved to Southern California to take up a surfing career and literally got drafted off my surfboard. So 
I had to start my education post-military, post-Vietnam. Um, but I was much more motivated and had a lot more things to anchor learning to. So that's the key thing for non-photographic memories is you have, I have to have some intellectual concept to anchor ideas to. And if I do, I learn extremely fast. Um, but, you know, so I can put very complex concepts together uh, coupled with intuition. Uh, the, the trouble is, quite often, I'm the only one in my universe uh, with the ideas. And, you know, um, all the things that I'm famous for, you know, were not easy rides. I had to convince a lot of people to do them or find other ways around it. Um, I knew the method that I developed would be a method that could be used to rapidly sequence the human genome, but there was a $5 billion public effort that sort of like public works, you know, divide things up and wanted to do things over a 15 year period. So nobody wanted to try the experiment of just using the mathematical tools. Um, but fortunately, greed comes to play in, in our country and in our world. And a company offered me $300 million to set up a new company to sequence the human genome. Um, so a few people believed that my ideas would work. Uh, but you have to go outside normal channels to get funding for things. Uh, but uh, it was a very complex idea with very complex teams to sequence the human genome, which we did in nine months for $100 million instead of $5 billion. But uh, that's an example. And I, and I also like your comments on play. Um, after Ham Smith and I made the first synthetic cell, uh, headlines across the world, uh, my picture was on the cover of Newsweek uh, with the headline, Playing God. So I've been accused of playing uh, quite a bit, so. Hey, you, can I ask you though, uh, on this, t I, I have been looking at the aphantasia literature that's been coming out more recently, and it confirms that it's overrepresented in so among scientists. Like it's a very common among like theoretical thinkers and mathematical thinkers and stuff. But can I ask you, because I think our minds work very different like if I, I hear that from most people, <laughs> okay. Um, do you, like if I say like think about your kitchen, what gets into your what's in your mind's eye? Like do you ha when you remember your kitchen, do you you have no mental imagery of it? No, none. Uh, I do know where the Grey Goose bottle is. Okay. <laughs> That's the important stuff, All right, <laughs> crucial. But I can't picture it. Now, what if I said because um, that's just a memory. If I use imagination and I, I combine two memories, like imagine a squid in your kitchen, what do you get? Like, what is it? I smell calamari cooking. <laughs> uh, this guy's a professional comedian. <laughs> Look at him. Yeah. So, um, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's hard for me because I think the neurodiversity is really a, uh, it's a really important issue and we're getting more sensitive to it now than we used to be even 10 years ago. And I think, I think a lot in images and, um, and it sounds like you don't at all. I know there, in philosophy there's two different concepts about concepts. One is that they're definitional. Sort of Aristotle thought you come up with an essential criteria and then you define it as like, like a bird would be like a, I don't know, like a, feather, a, a feathered biped or something that flies. And then, but then another view of concepts is that you have like an image of a bird, and this would be a prototype concept. And I, I'm pretty sure that's how I think about the bird. Like it's like a, a robin, and I have it in my mind's eye, and then other birds are sort of like radial spokes that come off of it further and further away. And way out here is like the penguin, and out there is the ostrich or whatever. So do you have something like a, like the, is your concept of bird for you more like a proposition? You see what I'm asking? It's not a picture. So it's, it's hard to describe what it is if it's not a picture. Um, I mean, I recognize a bird when I see one, you know? Uh, and uh, 
I, I also have very good uh, spatial orientation. You know, I navigated 65,000 miles around the world that, you know, uh, without sight of land. Um, I, you know, if I was blind, I think I would be able to find my way around. You know, I, I can navigate fairly well in the dark, but not because I can see pictures, but just good spatial orientation on things. So it's, um, you know, people that think in pictures can't imagine not thinking in pictures. Right. Yeah. Um, but I can't see my wife's face. I can't see my dogs. I can't see my sailboat, you know, any of the things that I do. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, a real advantage. So I had a good friend that also had uh, the same kind of intuitive thinking that I have. And he described it's like having a supercomputer running full time uh, in the background. And it's like the latest data on free will and consciousness. Um, I don't think we have free will in the sense that people imagine it. Um, but, you know, we get things in our consciousness by the supercomputer in the background, you know, spits out an answer or tells me, you know, a feeling or a concept, you know, and so um, because that's going on full time all the time, uh, you know, to me it's, it's just normal and for other highly intuitive people it is, but I'm one of the uh, fortunate few that my intuition is generally extremely accurate. And the only time I get into trouble is if I ignore my intuition. For people that don't have full-blown intuition, they quite often get in trouble by thinking they're following their intuition. But it totally depends on how good the supercomputer in the background is and what well, kind of information it processes. Because I have to think in concepts, uh, once I learn something, I'm able to build on the basis of that, which is extremely useful as a basic researcher. Um, and I'm able to make huge leaps that other people can't for some reason. I'm wondering too though if you, because now you're telling me that you are sort of committed to a deterministic, you think free will is kind of imaginary. I'm, I'm sort of on the fence on this, but I'm wondering. What's the question whether it's, you know, what's happening before it becomes part of our consciousness is built into our psyche as part of free will. Um, we just don't have control over see, those processes. Okay. Then what do you think about the, the sort of artificial um, imagination in these AI large language models where like ChatGPT is doing this kind of crazy uh, ability of sort of um, scraping the internet for all kinds of data and then creating these combinations that look totally intelligent. They look, you know, convincing. And even they look imaginative, they look artistic. You know, I was telling the AI the other day to write a, a, a progress report in the, in the voice of um, uh, Raymond Chandler and it was completely convincing, you know. And I'm just wondering, do you think that that's really what our brains are doing or it's just a totally different kind of imagination AI? It, it, it's really data processing. AI is totally based on the training sets that it has. Chat GTP and others are using the entire internet as their training set. So all the crap that's out there in the world is also part of the training set. And that's why roughly a third of the time it comes up with just pure lack of a better term, bullshit. Um, <laughs> and the biggest challenge, uh, I think, for people, uh, aside from politics, is sorting out what's true and what's not true. Right. And, and some of these AI things are going to blur that even more because they appear to be real. Right. You know, but it's very convincing stuff. The uh, one that uh, example that was on 60 Minutes, uh, it, it cited uh, five books uh, as the evidence for w whatever argument it came up with. And the book titles, everything sounded very real. 
<laughs> but but they were total bullshit. And uh, yeah, but they're getting better. They're getting yeah. better. <laughs> um, I'm wondering for both of you, this diversity of imagination, maybe a neurodiversity, we could even call it. You know, Temple Grandin, who's the famous. You know, they they now would call her a. In the past, they called her a high functioning autistic, but nowadays there's a different way of saying it. But she was only thinking in pictures. You know, that was most of how she was thinking. Not very much emotional or relational ability to imagine, or even in her mind, not really conceptual, just visual. But what kind of strengths? I, I guess I'm thinking about our kids and the way that you were educated and almost didn't make it through high school later to make this incredible discovery. How many kids are we losing by not recognizing the neurodiversity of imagination and what strengths go along with divergent forms of imagination like yours? No, I think that's a very key issue to me. So in inbred strains of rats, for example, neurons end up precisely in the same place in each brain, plus or minus uh, a few microns. So our brains are genetically hardwired, but they're all so, like we were talking about with epigenetics, they're hardwired to be plastic, so they're, they're changeable. But I'm sure photographic memories are hardwired just as aphantasia is hardwired. And, but the government doesn't want to fund studies on the brain to show differences in people that might be used in, in some sort of segregation, but it needs to be used. Um, so e each summer I talk to uh, a group of around 20,000 high school students in a soccer stadium outside of Boston. And I was explaining a Fantasia to them and, uh, and uh, I, I asked this group for a show of hands, how many had photographic memories? And so this is the best student from each high school around the country. It was 99% plus put up their hands. So that's genetic selection, you know. Uh, that, that's, that's how it works. I asked how many thought they might have aphantasia. It was like 20 or 30 uh, in, in the group. Um, so it just shows how much you know, the education system does select for photographic memories. Uh, success does not, uh, based on that selection, but it would be nice to know uh, at birth or early childhood, either based on the genome or based on brain MRI studies, um, but ultimately it would be a simple uh, genetic analysis to know where you are on that spectrum. And it's not one versus another because, you know, there, there's probably no two brains in this room that are truly alike. Um, and some people have some of these traits, some have uh, betters, you know, it's, it's uh, but <clears throat> I think it would have to, it would rewrite the education system. Um, there used to be special schools, one starting in London, uh, in the 50s or 60s that, you know, supposedly kids with learning disabilities. But I, I, you know, basically had a learning disability compared to somebody with a photographic memory. And uh, um, in the seventh grade, I got in a lot of trouble because um, I refused to take spelling test because I thought it was the dumbest thing to try and memorize a group of words to regurgitate them the next day on a test. So even though I worked out the largest spelling in history with the human genome, I'm a horrible <laughs> speller because <laughs> I didn't learn how to spell. But it was uh, people that, you know, uh, like my first ex-wife could just look at a list and that's all the studying they had to do to prepare for it. So people with aphantasia or somewhere on the spectrum, just have to work harder to do the same things. There's also a, a um, on the Temple Grandin thing, which I think she's a great example, um, there's a researcher named si uh, Simon Baron-Cohen who's looked at, um, there is a kind of 
I there thought he was an actor. That's, it's the cousin. That's his, <laughs> it's his brother or cousin or something, Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah. But Simon Baron Cohen, um, I think he's at Oxford, but he, he looks at uh, these interesting correlations. He said that, that with like high levels of testosterone, you'll find cognitive styles that are very attentive to pattern. And with lower levels of testosterone, you'll find higher levels of empathy, which is to sort of feed into a stereotype about men and women. But what he finds is that among Asperger's kids, they're very good at uh, recognizing patterns, and they're not very good with social emotion. Um, and so he, he divides empathy into cognitive empathy and affective empathy. If you are a sociopath, you basically have very high cognitive empathy because you can do perspective taking and meet the, sort of read the mind of another person so you can manipulate them. And you see very smart sociopaths or psychopaths doing this, the Ted Bundys of the world. But then the, the Temple Grant, or not the Temple Grandin, but, but the, a kid who's um, on the autism spectrum may have very low cognitive empathy. They can't read um, what's on your mind, but they have affective empathy, which is sort of, they can sort of intuit if you're sad, if you're happy, if you need a hug. So they're very emotional. And I, f I think this research is very compelling. It just shows you that just this, like the stuff Craig's talking about, his neurodiversity, we're just starting to open the, the gate on this stuff and it's only gonna get more interesting because it applies not just to how you think about concepts but also your emotional style. Well, um, both Dr. Asma and uh, Dr. Venture said they would take questions. So uh, if you'd like, I can come around and if you have a question. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask about the aphantasia, if it's just visual or if I ask you to sing your favorite song in your head, if you're able to do that, or if it just, it, it, can, is it conceptually, are the concepts just kind of replacing the visual part that you're not able to, or is it across the senses? So there's a whole spectrum of it, and uh, I, uh, I have perfect pitch in my head. Um, and, uh, you, you, you don't want me to try and reproduce it. Uh, I, I could make a living getting paid not to sing. Uh, but, uh, for, you know, uh, songs I like, you know, even from a very long time ago, you know, I can remember the exact tunes and, uh, you know, I get annoyed when uh, the song that came out on, well, dating myself on the record, um, you know, when they do a live album or something, they change it uh, a, a little bit, and sometimes they get pitchy, and I get annoyed by those things. But uh, um, some people uh, hear in colors, you know, I mean, there's, the, the, the human brain is such a sort of untapped resource in terms of investigating the range of human capabilities. It's, it's pretty stunning, but uh, um, no, I, you know, so I, I definitely like listening to music and reproduce it in my brain, but that's about the only place I can reproduce it. Do you ever get a song stuck in your head? All the time, <laughs> and it's really annoying. <laughs> They're called, that's why they're called earworms, right? Yes. Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank all of you on stage for this wonderful conversation. Uh, I wanted to also have an aphantasia question. I'm very interested in storytelling and imagination. And I was struck when you said that uh, you have to have an intellectual concept to anchor ideas to. And I was just curious if you think of, you know, a hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis, one way of framing that is a kind of story about what's happening. If you, th if you imagine with stories in your head or if you have causal relationships between concepts as you're working through ideas. So, um, I'm at my best with thinking, you know, if I hear new information, like a new seminar, you know, a new science that I hadn't heard of. Um, I was just at a uh, reunion with the top mathematicians and 
physicists that helped develop the uh, Solera algorithm for assembling the human genome. It was the 70th birthday party of, of one of my top algorithms. And there, there were two Nobel laureates that, you know, presented everything in equations and uh, talking about quantum computing and, and things that, uh, you know, I couldn't explain if I had to, but I was the only one asking them questions. And usually they had trouble answering my questions. So I, I, I can process information from external sources uh, versus generating it de novo, but I get an, a totally different perspective on it than almost anybody else in the room. I, I actually have sort of a, a just a, a, an addition here, which is if you look at a, a logical argument, like a syllogism, like uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, everybody can sort of see that right away because it's so simple. All the, but I noticed that if you do a, uh, if the theory is long and complicated or the argument is long and complicated, I don't get it as a story. But if you do a Venn diagram of it, I instantly see it. And I know there are other people like that too, that if you put it into an image medium, they can see the logical relations better. Yeah, I agree with that. I was uh, in bonehead algebra, but the highest level of geometry. You know, it's yeah, just like right. strange. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been very delightful. Um, the question I had was, can we learn those different modalities of imagining or perspective? Like if I wanted to learn how to think more in an Eposia mindset, what would that look like? And, and I'm, I'm gonna be that guy asking two questions in one. <laughs> um, what does a society look like if we have like systems that sort of honor the duplicities and complexities of neurodivergency. Like, w would that make us better human? And would that make us more joyful, better humans in a way? I'll answer the second question if you answer the first. I don't even remember. <laughs> That's what happens with multiple questions. But I, I, I think would actually, uh, uh, you know, for example, physicians getting into medical schools totally selected on the base of rote memorization skills and regurgitation on test. Uh, um, 99.9 percent, .9%, but uh, I mean there's a few exceptions, uh, but um, you know they're still based on the same statistics. Whereas in, in a lot of people discover once they start seeing patients and things that they didn't really want to be a physician, they were doing it because somebody else made them. Uh, if we had selection criteria based on, uh, you, know, you know, a different type of learning and different type of skill set. So, um, I'm extremely good at learning techniques. Um, I was doing major surgery in Vietnam. Um, at 19, I was teaching interns and residents how to do spinal taps and liver biopsies, how to bow a hospital here in San Diego. Because in the when you're in the military, there's no liability. It's uh, just based on your skill set what somebody trained you to do and allowed you to do. And we're starting to see more and more of these people in medicine as nurse practitioners and people that didn't make it to medical school, but in fact generally have far more uh, skills than people that were selected based on uh, rote memorization standing in school or anything else. So, that, that's just an example. I think if, uh, uh, if we had a much broader representation, and it's hard to know, you know, for everybody that's been successful like me, how many are left aside? And I'm guessing it's a pretty large number of people. Uh, I was, you know, I, it also helps to be lucky, but, uh, you know, I've had, 
circumstances, some that I've made for myself and some that you know, others made for me. But uh, it would be nice to shift the balance, and I think almost every field would benefit from that shift. And, and I do remember the first question. Uh, in terms of like adopting, I think there's a real divide between like the way our minds work, and that should just be celebrated, because I don't think I can think the way he does and he can't think the way I do. But as Craig was saying, the, the brain is like a, is a plastic system, and like the Hebbian principle is what fires together, wires together. So if you are developing as a little kid and somebody is exposing you and stimulating you in a certain way, you're going you're gonna to be able to pick up certain skills because of the influence of environment and nurture. But it's not infinitely plastic. There's, a, I think, a, there are constraints on it, I suspect. And then what's interesting is there's evidence that when there are injuries, like you lose a leg or something, um, the brain is also uh, open again to rewiring. Um, so it, it looks like it, you can, we could probably do better understanding and actually getting into the minds of others, but I do think there are some constraints on it. Yeah, it point. does sound like some of the scientists today were sharing uh, that imagination is in part a trait and in part a skill that could be practiced or could be learned. Amy Kind is here who talked about imagination as a skill. So l l let me ask you, where do you put creativity on top of imagination? Because I don't think you can teach true creativity. Uh, I don't know if you can teach imagination, um, but... Uh, I think you can do exercises. You could do imagination exercises um, I, there is some stuff that I think can't be taught. I'm, I mean, I know I'm, I'm supposed to say, oh, you could be anything and you could be taught anything. That's kind of the culture we live in. But I do think some people are just naturally uh, really advanced at image. Kids come out and they can do amazing uh, drawings that somebody could spend 50 years trying to do and they can't do it. Um, I think we should just acknowledge that that's just a gift that they have. Um, but I do think imagination can be juiced up and by practicing, like one of the things I think we do is we use metaphors to think. And so you, you think of like a, like a source domain and then a target domain. So you think about like, how am I gonna live my life? And then you use um, the movies you watch, the plays, Shakespeare, and then you try to, to in, a way, in a way understand yourself and other people through this artwork. And that is a kind of exercise of the imagination. And the more you do it, I think the better you get at it. But I do think, again, there's, there's also sort of creative genius that I don't think can be taught. Well, there's an argument, uh, because manic depression is clearly genetic. And uh, there's a famous psychiatrist at uh, Johns Hopkins who argued if we try and cure genetic diseases like manic depression that will essentially wipe out all creativity in the human race uh, because every major uh, well-known uh, creative event, uh, it's been somebody that's somewhere on the manic depression spectrum, including myself. That's a, a fairly pessimistic read, which I'm... <laughs> no, nope, but I'm an optimist. Okay, but you're not. I mean, I think you're right. I think I would call that melancholy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, that connection between creativity and depression is, is very interesting. Some people debate it. They'll say, well, you need that kind of um, separation from social life and that interior reflective life that, that, that depression and melancholy can give. But other people point out that oftentimes when you're in that state, you don't produce anything. You're just too, do you're too down, you're, you lack but, but, vitality. But, but you picked the wrong side of the equation. Did, did I? Yes, it, it's during the manic phase that so many good things happen. Yeah, the mania is the fun part. Yeah, the mania. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, very simple and a slightly more complicated one. Craig, I'm sure many of us are wondering about dreaming. Uh, about dreaming, how, uh, about manifestations of your aphantasia in dreaming. But Stephen, I wanted to ask you about, you know, speaking as somebody who makes his living from imagination. Um, Einstein called it the Gedanken experiment, 
where you project yourself into a situation, work it out, but then tested it against reality. Do you think I imagination evolved as a feedstock to be tested, of things to be tested and to be verified? That it's not playing with the net down because reality tests whether your idea was good or not. You want to go first on that? Um, So I get asked quite often, you know, whether I dream in pictures or not. And I, you know, I, I do dream. In fact, I track sleep and things, so I know how much I have in that phase. But I can't answer the question because I'm always asleep. <laughs> so I have very vivid dreams, but I can't tell you whether they're in color or pictures. Uh, and even thinking about the dreams, uh, I can't conjure up any colors or pictures associated with them, but they're very realistic scenarios in my dreams. So um, I, I, I daydreaming, I don't see colors or pictures. And I, um, you said you make your living by imagination. What do you do? Science fiction author. Oh, OK. Um, I do think that uh, th the imagination is extremely useful, and that's why it became a target of natural selection, that it helps our crummy little species get advantages in, out of it and resources out of the environment. I, I hesitate, however, to say that's all it is, because I think this idea of exaptation or spandrels sort of makes sense to me, that it could start out just as a way to think about, okay, what predators are out there? How can I, you know, flint nap these tools better? And eventually, like, it's just a way of surviving in that way. But it also then takes on a life of its own and goes into these areas that are, it's hard to sort of say they're useful or functional. They really have their own sort of um, elaborate, you know, existence. In fact, we were talking today in this workshop, maybe that is the point is to transcend the useful and the functional and to enter this realm. This is going to sound kind of cosmic and weird, but it's just sort of like pure play. Um, why does everything have to, to be just about survival? So I'm kind of on the fence about this. I think for the most part, that's how it evolves is because it's very adaptive. Just imagining monsters in the, in the woods is, is a way of avoiding real predators. So it's a very use horror, you know, is a great way to, for our species to, in a sense, survive better, because that is culturally transmitted, both horizontally and vertically. But then I also think there's just, you know, there's just Proust, and there's, you know what I mean? There, and there's just Mozart, and it doesn't have to make my life, it doesn't have to make me procreate better. <laughs> the spice <laughs> you know of I mean? life, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we've talked about imagination as a trait, as a skill but there's a way that we call it the Atlas of Imagination at the Clark Center, and there's a way that imagination can be seen as a territory. Spending time in the territory of imagination may have benefits we just don't know about. And by the way, if you're a student in here, imagination studies is a fairly underrepresented field. So there are a lot of open questions that are ready to be investigated and pursued. Good luck getting funding, but no, I'm kidding. You will get funding. <laughs> but it's also clear anybody who has uh, dogs or cats or other mammals, imagination is clearly part of everything in the animal kingdom, and e even you know further layers down. You know, uh, octopi are one of the most you know uh, you know they pl they go through play and you know but plays a way of, you know, like their mock battles, their mock yeah. hunting, their way of honing skills, uh, you know, keeping reflexes sharp. Um, I don't think there would have been mammalian or human evolution <coughs> without imagination. At least I can't imagine it. So, so one uh, last question. The, uh, <laughs> I, I suppose that, that these skill sets 
are spread diffusely throughout the brain. But I, I'm wondering if there's any geographical localization that under, underpins you know, some of these ways of thinking. And that, I guess one way you could do that, if a very small tumor or a hemorrhage or something has ever seriously knocked out very specifically a way of thinking imaginatively. Well, I'll take that one. Uh, so as a physician uh, selected for my rote memory, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and, for, and, uh, and I've been extremely fortunate, like you, in uh, people who have uh, advanced my life and career. And the answer to your question is that I've had patients come to me who said they lost their imagination. And, uh, and one particular patient was a design student. And you can imagine, you could imagine, we might be able to imagine that that was very distressing to them. So in fact, there are studies on the localization and, and more importantly, the networks in the brain. So there are not really spots in the brain where things happen. It's interconnections between them. And in fact, we had a wonderful discussion at the talk this, this afternoon again around that. So we can see uh, the operations of the brain in our, our fabulous neuroscience technologies. Um, and you're quite right. Things happen. As you know, with strokes, we can lose our language or our strength. Um, and as I said, I've had a patient who have had patients who came and said, they lost their imagination. It was a young man, and I saw him a few weeks later, and it had come back. So, Eric, can we take one more question? Yeah. Um, when I look at this screen and the rest of the scene, everything looks sharp, but that's not in my eye. It's, it's sharp right there, and everything else is fuzzy. So I'm constructing a view of the world. Now, a little bit beyond that is, the people sitting in front of me, I don't see their face, but I know there's a face, and it's very easy to imagine what it would be and to be imagine it's wrong. So I'm thinking that just the model building that we construct the world with is a key to our ability to imagine, but I, I don't know. Well, my, my take on that is um, that the uh, imagination is so active in all your thinking that it's also a large part of perception itself. People think of perception like it's, oh, you're taking a picture or you're recording something accurately. But there's a lot of evidence that there's a philosopher named Marilou Ponty who says, you see this chair, but you also, you know that it has a back on it. And that's because your perception is already theory laden. It's already loaded with your previous experiences and theories about it. And your, your imagination is organizing these perceptions all the time. Like you said, the people in front of you, you can't, it turns out they don't have faces. It's weird. You can't see this, but they're really strange. No, I, I, you know they have faces even though you haven't seen them. And that's not something that's added later onto your perceptions like, okay, let's check the perception. It's actually in the perception itself. You are seeing through the imagination, I think. And in the realm of mental disorders, like we talked about, there is such a thing as negative imagination where you have a tendency to imagine the worst and the way you fill in the blanks is all through the opposite of rose-colored glasses. You know, So what you're imagining, you're seeing a different world than other people. Can we take one more, Eric? One more. Well, thank you so much for accommodating me and for this fascinating discussion. So. Uh, I guess my question was something that you were discussing already, but I wanted to sort of expand on that uh, and talk about how can we improve on creativity other than just hard work and practice, right? And you know, you talked about that certain creative genius cannot be taught, perhaps, but like if we are thinking about ways to improve creativity, when we look at how this, how people with a lot of neurodiversity employ their creativity, so somebody who does not use pictures or somebody who exclusively use picture, uses pictures, if we understand how they use their uh, creativity and how do, how do they use their skills, can we use that to somehow create uh, training modules, things like that, that would allow uh, kids 
maybe who are not along one or the other end of the spectrum, but allow them to perhaps improve their creativity? So uh, Craig, in fact, that was my kind of thought and question for you in your command of these uh, incredible projects that you've done in your life. You've had to work with people of all different variants and, uh, and forms of imagination. How did, how did you work to manage that to, to make your great accomplishments? That's an interesting question because, you know, at, at Solera we had four major teams. So we had the mathematical algorithm team. We had the team that had to build uh, the supercomputer. Uh, we had the team that was just uh, uh, processing the samples and then the team that actually sequenced all the DNA, which was a team that was more robotically inclined and in dealing with all, the, all these different things. But they, they all had very different mindsets and skill sets. Um, but I'm the one that led building a supercomputer, even though I couldn't possibly have done any of the steps myself. I knew what had to be written in terms of the algorithms, but I've never written a line of code, so I couldn't have done it. And so, you know, the orchestra conductor knows the music, right? That you can't lead an orchestra if you don't know the, the music. And so I often liken my role much more to be the orchestra conductor uh, that I knew the music, because in fact, the music only existed in my head. Uh, but I got the trombone players to play with the, uh, the violin players, and uh, it all worked. But they were all interdependent and none of them could do the other person's job. And in fact, that's uh, uh, we've talked about today, about uh, imagination as a skill, and I'll put a little shout out for our center and one of our works called, uh, one of our activities called Tools for Imagination. And in fact, we have a course, course module called Imagination for Engineering that's been funded by uh, the research directorate and the School of Engineering for us. So we're, at, we're working to answer that question directly. How to optimize teams, how to, for, for teams to come together and understand how they work. Do you have a group that looks into pharmaceutical approaches? Well, that's the next one. So uh, no, no, no kidding. So we're, we're working on that. In fact, I am uh, one of the co-founders of the Psychedelic Research Center here at UCSD. And I think one of the interesting pathways for exploration around increasing creativity is not so much about cultivating more creativity, but instead about removing the barriers to creativity. Barriers to creativity, unfortunately, can come from our storytelling narrative brain. Our, this, is what, this is the only thing that can be true. And one of the potential mechanisms of psychedelics in therapeutic use and in potentially increasing creativity would be that it temporarily deactivates the inhibitions to creativity. Right. It allows you to think not just outside of the box, but like there is no box. And so, uh, all of the food has been uh, spiked with hallucinogens. <laughs> right. so. You're welcome. So, so nobody has a face, is that what you're saying? Yes. But, but I, I'd like to ask somebody that thinks in pictures whether uh, you like or enjoy psychedelics because with, with my brain type, uh, I cannot tolerate them oh, at right? all. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't ever want to lose control of my brain functions. That, that, that's very interesting. So you had a negative experience, or you just don't want to have the experience? I've had, you know, minor negative experiences. Okay. You but, can plead you know, the fifth. Things yeah. like cocaine are totally different. That's a, they're no well, you've heard it here, people. Craig has been... <laughs> so, oh, I'm quite, I quite in sympathy with your idea of not losing control. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I dug it in, uh, and uh, I found the quote, and it's kind of... Uh, pessimistic from Clark. You know, I, I, one of my reasons of being thrilled to be with the uh, Clark Center is that Clark was just this incredible futurist. 
But he did say that it's yet to be proven that intelligence has any survival value. And so uh, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, we should take that as a cautionary tale for what we're doing to our society and our planet. And as we talked about before, uh, imagination, we think, is the ingredient that's going to keep us going. So Dr. Beaton and I would thank, like to thank so much uh, Dr. Stephen Asma and Dr. Craig Venter for this evening.